when Elvis started coming up with these psychic powers, you know, whatever, you stand out and uh, say, what are you doing, Elvis? Why is it plows? All right? I'm going to part them. Okay? <laughs> yeah, they part them. And I was just like, what do you see? And I looked up. Sure enough, you know, I saw these two, two things. I saw on the right side of the highway, there was a perfect silhouette of Elvis facing that way. You know, I mean, perfect. And on the other side was Joseph Stalin. And I, he said, what, what do you see? I said, damn, that, that looks just like you. And that looks just like Joseph Stalin. Yeah. Let's go. And we got back on the <laughs> motorhome and took off. You're the best investigative reporters I can get the world today. You know, we don't have a lot of interviews with Elvis or, or records of direct things that he said. Yeah, um, just a know, little. Just a little. Just a little. Yeah. I mean, what we have is... It's okay. <laughs> That's cool. Just a parent. That's fine. Just don't show your butt. This is Pamela, by the way. Such a weird name for a cat. Yeah. Uh, I didn't pick it. Um, yeah, she picked Austin Butler and Ann Margaret <laughs> for the other cats. Guilty. And Marlo. And Marlo. Oh, but okay. It so you were saying... Believe it or not, this video was supposed to be about Larry Geller. Larry who? <laughs> Obviously, we have gone way off track, but let's talk about Larry Geller. All right, let's talk about Larry Geller. Since he was our focus. Yeah. Um, so actually, trying to kind of rein some of this back in, why we were talking about the different figures in the story, you know, Elvis's intimates who have told us the story, is that I was talking a little bit about how this becomes the study of them, too. Organically, you just get to know them, you know, and they become very real the characters are very real people to you. And I think that the Memphis Mafia was a really interesting study on group dynamics. Yeah. I, like we were saying with one of the other videos, they really need their own movie. You yeah. know, that's, where's, that's where's the, the Memphis one. Mafia movie? <laughs> that's the one I want to see. And Scatter. Yeah. They need, well, you know. <laughs> no, but the Memphis Mafia movie, I think, because they get, like, unavoidably, I think they get the short end of the stick. They do. They do. They do. I mean, like in the Priscilla movie, I don't even think they had names, you know. But Larry Geller was mentioned in there specifically. Oh, yeah. That's how I got the idea to do this video in the first place. This goes back to right after we saw the movie. We did a really quick reaction video about that at the time. Not even really a review. And one of the things that I brought up in that video was that an aspect of the movie that really hadn't landed for me was the way that it handled Elvis's, for lack of a better way to put it, spiritual era, or the, the Larry Geller period. The first Larry Geller leg of that. Because yeah, um, he came, was exiled, and then came again. Came back, yeah. Like, I was disappointed with how the movie handled that phase of Elvis's life. I felt like it was, I think I used the word reductive in that video, but I, I just felt like they were playing that for laughs. It kind of made Elvis look a little silly. You know, like he was just supposed to be this vapid celebrity who was kind of getting caught up in this gobbledygook. And Larry was reduced to like this, you know, he had one, it was just one quick blink and you'll miss it thing. And the actor that they cast and the whole vibe of that scene just did not, feel like Larry Geller to me. And Timothy Larry and Wink Martindale had a baby and that was Larry. <laughs> yeah. That was their Larry Geller. Yeah, that's actually exactly what it was like. If you kind of look at the period of time when Larry came into his life, this was about midway through the movie year. So I think this was really the point where it was dawning on him that the movies weren't going to get any better. You know, where he really did feel trapped and on this assembly line with cranking out one film after the other of diminishing quality, you know. And the, the movie experience was something that from accounts had started out as something that was so promising and exciting for him you know and I think realizing that 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 this was kind of the mold that he was stuck in and only being halfway through it I mean knowing that he was committed with contracts and obligations and there was no way out and having that kind of pressure on him having that kind of demand on him yeah, tremendous um, pressure all the time tremendous pressure all the time and thanks girl when Larry came along, there was a need for an outlet. And I think this was expressed in other areas of his life, too. The ranch, the different things that he, I think, sort of lost himself in when he could. to ranch, sort of escape. golf carts, slot cars, guns, remote control airplanes. Yeah, yeah. Something about what Larry brought to the table resonated for him in a sense that he not only needed an outlet, but you know, was also really trying to make sense of his life. And I think that was a very real experience. And I think it's interesting, too, when you look at, like, some of the things that, some of the concepts
concepts that Larry introduced to Elvis, some of that stuff by today's standards has been so integrated into the mainstream that there's not, you know, that we just kind of take for granted that like things like yoga and meditation are part of everyday life for a lot of people. Some of these stories about Elvis and Larry's behavior at this time does, I think, maybe come across as a little intense. But I think that was the spirit of the times as well. You know, it was an intense time. But if you think about him entering Elvis's life in 1964, looking at America in 1964, he was like maybe a beat ahead of the zeitgeist where this stuff, I think, really gained more traction as the 60s wore on. And a lot of it was very popularized in the 70s. And, you know, I mean, maybe sometimes you just want to talk about the weather or what's for lunch or, you know, I yeah. mean, <laughs> I might not. Yeah. And I say this to somebody who has affection for Larry, but yeah. I might not have always been in the mood. Well, you just want to talk about football. <laughs> well, you do, right? Yeah. I mean, for some of them, there was a sense that Larry looked down on them, didn't maybe think that they had the intellectual capacity to understand what he was talking about or that kind of thing. And I could see being insulted by that if, if that was the impression that they had. Yeah, you no know, one wants to be I wouldn't cast like in that. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I wouldn't like that either, you know. And I don't think they were rubes, you know. I mean, that's just not you know, the impression that They I were had. somewhat provincial overall, but they weren't, I wouldn't say rubes. No, you know, the had a very passive relationship with Larry and seemed to really perceive him as a threat. And so part of how he, you know, expressed this was, like, taking these little passive-aggressive digs, like... Telling Larry, oh, you would have been a great hypnotist in my carny days. You know, I could just see you on the stage working the crowd. Didn't you say um, that he gave him a, he made him a man? Yeah, yeah. And, which was kind of saying, hey, I know you're, you're a hustler, or you're fake, you're fraud. Yeah. You're playing Elvis. Oh, then one of the anecdotes from Larry was that he went to this day spa that the colonel had recommended to him. And the woman behind the counter... Sorry, sounds bad. Yeah, the, the, when he said his name, the woman behind the counter was like, Oh, the colonel told me about you. You're the magician, right? <laughs> and so Larry was like, No, you know, he was, he was just <laughs> making a joke. And she was really disappointed, like her face fell. And she was like, Oh, well, I was hoping you would show me some of your tricks. Yeah. You know, and when you go back to the times again, there were a lot of movements. I mean, it was, you know, those were wild days from what I've read. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I remember a couple of them. <laughs> it's not, you know, a foreign experience for me to be the, the odd duck in the room, you know, or or the weirdo in the crowd and stuff. So it's like, <laughs> in that sense, I can relate to Larry. Freak to freak, I get, I get him in some ways, you know. Yeah. Speaking of which, though, so since I am steeped in, in Larry Gellerology at the moment, I'm going to share a couple of things because I think they're interesting. Um, Lay it on me. Okay. He first began his spiritual interest because his family had moved to Southern California when he was young and his grandmother was murdered. And hmm. that was something that was very traumatic for his family, obviously. Right. And prior to that, he said his family hadn't been particularly religious. They were cultural Jews, but, but didn't really attend services or that kind of thing. They weren't particularly devout. Right. But his mother, in terms of her trying to sort of make sense of what had happened, became interested in spirituality and, you know, trying to sort of understand different people's perspectives on things. And so she became very immersed in learning about different religions and their ideas about life and death. Larry was like maybe 11 or 12 at that time, and he, the person who was home with his mother the most, and so she would talk to him about it, you know, and mm -hmm. he was very receptive and also kind of gained an interest in it. So oh. this started for him when he was pretty young, you know, and that was, that was kind of an interesting part of his backstory, very tragic part of his backstory. Well, that's interesting because you think about late, in later life, he had this connection with Elvis, and this reaction from all the Memphis Mafia, even varying reactions. And but really the seed of all those is arguably his grandmother's death. So you never know where someone's coming from. And, and Larry's life is interesting to me, too, because spirituality really brought him to the right place at the right time for a couple of key moments when he was very young that really defined the rest of his life. Mm -hmm. And I was interested with this, with learning more about Jay Sebring, because I'd always known that he was um, Larry's, hairstyling mentor that's right you know yeah. and i knew of course tragically that he was a victim of the manson family murders oh yeah um but i didn't know very much about him or his career you know or him as a person i guess when he was like in a young man in his early 20s bumbling around trying to figure out what he wanted to do with his life and a friend had suggested to him that since he had a creative and artistic streak that maybe he might like hairstyling. He went to cosmetology school, and he hadn't even finished that yet, but he happened to be walking down the street one day, 
and he came across a building that had an Ankh, the Egyptian symbol for life, um, outside. And so that drew him in, you know, because he was well immersed in his spiritual interests at right. that point. And um, not knowing that it was a hair salon, he just was kind of interested in what was going on in here. So so he went inside and met Jay Sebring, who was just getting ready to open the salon. And when he found out that Larry was a stylist, he invited him to work for him. And this ended up being, like, very fortuitous for Larry, because the salon became not only a huge success, but, like, um, you know, a very chic, it was kind of the epicenter of <laughs> Hollywood chic at the time. Um, they specialized only in men's haircuts. And, uh, and apparently what Jay Sebring did was really revolutionize the, the male hair care industry. I guess up to this point, men's haircuts involved like a dry cut with clippers and that was pretty much it. Yeah. Well, um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so Jay Sebring had this idea that was really revolutionary to kind of treat the male haircut experience like, like a female high end salon. And so this involved shears and um, handheld blow like dryers, which weren't common this in the U.S. The I didn't know that until I was reading into this. this washing the hair done. before it was styled, and they create they the they created a lot of the really iconic looks, male haircut iconic right. looks, like Jim Morrison, who was a friend of J.C. Brings. And so this became like a really not only like the chic place to go for men in Hollywood, but it, it introduced Larry to a lot of celebrities. He rubbed elbows with a lot of the clientele. So he met a lot of famous people doing this. And another thing, when I was reading about Jay Sebring and how he himself became a bit of an icon during that time, mm -hmm. he was a very famous ladies man for one thing, you know, but kind of rich and, and stylish and chic and hip. And he became a little bit of an icon himself. And yeah. so, so it was a big deal when he was murdered, you know? Yeah, yeah. And when I was reading about, I read about he had a lot of very close celebrity friends, and one of them was Warren Beatty. And so that made me think, like, oh, was he the basis for the Warren Beatty character in Shampoo? That's, that seems um, like a strong possibility. Apparently there are, like, five different people who claim that, like, that character was based on them. Yeah, there always is. Jay Sebring's story obviously ended very tragically. I'd always known that J.C. Bring was very close with Sharon Tate, and that's why he was visiting her that night. But from reading about it, I mean, apparently most people felt that he was always in love with her. Yeah. Um, he lost her to Roman Polanski, but, um, but you know, never stopped loving her, just wanted to be in her life, you know, no matter yeah. what. and they were friends then. And because Roman Polanski was away um, on location filming at that point. Roman, if you're watching this, um, yeah, he is. Yeah, yeah. J.C. Bring essentially kind of moved in with Sharon Tate because she was late in her pregnancy, and so he wanted he wanted to help be there for her. So that's very sad, you know. He, yeah, it is. It's he, very it's he, very tragic. It's a terrible was, it's a terrible story. And by all accounts, Sharon Tate, everybody that knew her says that she was just a golden soul. So Larry's already somebody who you know has been around the block a couple of times and and has bumped up against celebrity. Yeah, and and, and things that made history. So Jay Sebring was actually the first person from the salon who cut Elvis's hair. Well, this is what Sonny West claims. So Sonny says that he had some friend and he noticed that this guy's hair looked the same every day, which he was really impressed by, but he managed <laughs> to maintain the same style. So he asked him who did his hair and he sent him to Jay Sebring. And then Elvis was like impressed with Sonny's hair and was like, how come your hair looks the same every day? And so Sonny was like, oh, well, you know, I've been getting it done at the salon. And so then Elvis... I never would have thought that Sonny would be the one. Sonny had really good hair when he was young. Um. <laughs> yeah. That stopped. But, well, look at who's talking, right? So when Elvis heard about the Jay Sebring salon, he was like, no, I want Jay Sebring himself to cut my hair. Well, of course, because he's you Elvis. Know, right? And yeah. so Jay Sebring came and cut his hair, and Elvis really liked it at first, but then the next morning, he couldn't get it to style in the same way again, and he was like... <laughs> So he called Jay Sebring and was like, no, you need to come fix this. And Jay Sebring sent Sal Orfice, who became Elvis' the stylist for a while. Who? And his name was Sal Orfice, or Orphis. Um, Orphis? Or, or, it's like O-R-F-I-C-E. Um, okay. Yeah. He's, in every Elvis biography, you hear about him because he's kind of the, the one who recommended Larry. The oh, spot. that's Sal Orphis. Yes. That one. I mean, Orphis. Orphis, Orphis. If anybody knows, just, you know, drop it in the comments. But, um, please help us. But, um, 
So, so Sal said, Larry, and you know, this is a, a key thing too. A lot of times when you hear the story about how Larry and Elvis bonded during that first haircut, it's kind of presented like out of nowhere, Elvis just turned to Larry and was like, so Larry, what are you all about? Um, but I've also heard variations where it was more like Sal had kind of briefed Elvis about, you know, he was telling him about Larry and was like, yeah, he's really into the spiritual stuff. It's, it's kind of out there. And so really what Elvis said was, um, so Larry, you know, Sal tells me some interesting things about what you're into. Tell me about that, which makes a difference, right? You know, yeah, it's not exactly, it's not exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. My hair is fine, but, but what I really want to know, Larry, yeah. is what are you all about? What are you all? Yeah. So at that point, Larry began to talk about his spiritual interests, and clearly something about that really resonated with all this. Um, yeah. He immediately said to Larry, hey, leave the salon, come to work for me full time. You can be my hairstylist, but I also need your room because I need somebody to talk to you this stuff about. So that was, again, Larry's spirituality, you know, I mean, really. Yeah, his, Larry's spirituality really got him his career, got yeah. him Elvis. I mean, it's it's interesting, right? Yeah, yeah. it was like his big break was the fact that he was interested in this stuff. Of course, as everyone knows, Larry joined the fold. He was not accepted with open arms. By these accounts, Elvis began to spend hours talking with Larry and spending less time with them. And, you know, they started to feel that this became a, a pretty all-consuming pursuit, you know, which confused them. You know, in some ways, I think it concerned them because, you know, by some people's opinions, they thought maybe this was getting a little too intense. And then, of course, there's the famous Stalin in the Clouds story and things like this, which, again, I can understand. I mean, on the one hand, you kind of think about the spirit of the times, and that seems like something that would have happened in the 60s, right? You know, it's a very, it's a very 60s experience. Yeah. Um, you know. But well, it's interesting, too. I always think about the fact that you think about it's the 60s and how old these people were. You know, they grew up in the 40s. Yeah. You know? Yeah, yeah. And Stalin was... You know, a personality that was well known in the 40s was well known to them. Mm -hmm. Nowadays, I'm sure you find a lot of people who, you know, don't have a ready image in their mind for what Stalin, Stalin even looks like. Yeah. But then they did, because that was their time. Yeah. Well, and today they'd see somebody else. You know? I see I see Taylor Swift. Yeah. Like, I heard it from um, Red one time, not, not personally. <laughs> uh, me and Red were, you know, shooting the breeze. And um, he had punched me, you see, and then we started talking. Yeah, his version of it is him and Elvis outside in the desert. During this time is when Elvis started coming up with these psychic powers, you know, whatever, stand out and uh, say, what are you doing, Elvis? Watch the clouds, all right? I'm going to part them, okay? <laughs> yeah, they part them. You know, he said, what do you see? And I looked up, and sure enough, you know, I saw these two two things. I saw on the right side of the highway, there was a perfect silhouette of Elvis facing that way. You know, I mean, perfect. And on the other side was Joseph Stalin. And I, he said, what, what do you see? I said, damn, that, that looks just like you, and that looks just like Joseph Stalin. Yeah. Let's go. And we got back on the <laughs> motorhome and took off. But, obviously, Larry tells the story. It's him and Elvis. And so, I mean, that's a big difference. So how can two people, what's the explanation for two people having? Now we're in the Arizona desert. And for about an hour or two, Elvis was very quiet. We're all looking at clouds in this in the sky. I'm sitting shotgun, which I always did on these trips. All of a sudden, Elvis said to me, "Look, look! Do you see what I see?" And I look. I said, "Oh, wow! Yeah." And he said, "What the hell is the face of Joseph Stalin doing in the clouds?" And I started looking at the cloud. And all of a sudden, it started to diffuse into a little fluffy cloud again. So I wasn't, I didn't know what was going on. Yeah. He pulls the bus over. Now, in our bus, because we have a caravan of cars behind us with the equipment and this, the wardrobe, blah, blah, blah. In our cab was Red West, Jerry Schilling, 
and Billy Smith. But they're behind us. And we said, Lawrence, come with me. And we ran to the desert. And he turns around, he looks at me. Tears are flowing down his cheeks. And he grabs me. I love you, Lord. I love you, man. You're right. You're right. You're right. You're right. It finally happened. I don't believe in God anymore. I don't have to. Now I know. Larry, you saw that. You saw that face. I said, yeah, I saw it. He said, why Stalin? He was the most evil. He started to swear a little bit. He was worse than Hitler. He killed millions and millions and millions of people. I thought, and I was talking to God. I was saying, God, what is the truth? What is the truth? Show me. Just show me. I'll do whatever you tell me to do. And all of a sudden, a lightning bolt came out of that cloud and struck my heart and went into every fiber, every part of my being. I was filled with God and God's love. God is love, Larry. Now I know. God is love. He's in you. He's in me. He's in everyone. He's in the, he's in the mountains. He's in the dirt. He's in frogs. He's in... God is everything. Now I know, Larry. It happened. It happened. It happened. Cars are whizzing by. And Elvis said, can you imagine what the fans would think of me if they saw me now? I said, yeah. They love you even more. This happened around the time that Elvis had become extremely interested in the idea of enlightenment. And he really wanted to have his, like, epiphany moment. And so, and Larry had had one, which he shared with Elvis. And so, you know, Elvis wanted to have that kind of an experience. He was reading about it a lot in some of the different texts and things, too. And, and what do I know? Maybe it was Stalin in the clouds. I wasn't there. Stranger things have happened in this world. And, you know, I mean, anything is possible. I'm not, I'm not ruling anything out. But I know you are because you're a skeptic. I'm like <laughs> half... See, I'm skeptical of skeptics. I'm equal part skeptic and romantic. So both sides of my brain are engaged in this. So, yeah. And all of these things can't be true. Or they can all be true. We don't know. Okay, Larry. <laughs> I could sort of see the other guys watching this from afar or observing this and kind of thinking, this is starting to get a little intense. No, most you of know. the other guys are more pragmatic. Sure. For all the clashing that they might have done with Larry, like, you do kind of read about bits and pieces of this interesting them at different times, you know, or certain ones who are a little bit more receptive to it. So, like that know. little guy. What's his name? Charlie. Charlie Hodge, yeah. He's about that big. No, he's not. He's like this big. <laughs> <laughs> I like Charlie. I like Charlie, too. You know, I, I, yeah, I like them all. You know, almost, almost all of them. And I find all of them interesting, even if I don't like them. Yeah, but Elvis was very passionate about this, and that became a threat to the colonel. Part of the canon piece of that, too, is that Elvis was after he had his moment of epiphany, was questioning, I can't keep doing these, you know, teeny bopper movies and, and doing something that has no meaning and contemplated becoming a monk for about two seconds, it sounds like. Plus, Elvis was, you know, kind of beginning to do things that were a little bit uncharacteristic for him, like stalling to come to the set, wanting to spend time at the ranch instead of going to, to film the next movie. And so this, this was problematic for the colonel. It was also around the time that the movies... I would say it took a major dip in quality, subsequently a dip in profit. And so I think the colonel felt like this was kind of a, an iffy time, and this needed to be reined back in. And, and, so, and, I, and I think the colonel was probably also thinking about what's the next step, you know, mm -hmm. thinking down the road, seeing the end of the line with this stuff. He's got to make, he's got to figure out his next uh, move to keep his to keep his money maker nose to the grindstone. Between the ranch and Larry, I think the colonel felt like he had a lot of competition. And then, so then that takes us to the famous clam bake incident. So I keep wanting to call that crab dip. Crab dip. Um, yeah. So crab dip. And I have to say, like, we watched crab dip for the first time, I don't know, maybe like a year ago. 
Oddly enough, yeah. And so. I'm not trying to be melodramatic, because I like Elvis's movies. I think they get a bad rap. I'm going to do a video yeah. defending them eventually. I think people are too hard on them, too. Yeah. And Elvis was actually a, 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 a good actor and a very good comedic actor. Absolutely. He just never had the chance to, to run, you know, free. Exactly, exactly. He could have been good. Not to be over dramatic. But there was a point when I was watching that movie, and it's like that weird scene where Red's an ice cream man. Yeah, that um, was so almost disturbing. Yeah, and he's got this creepy shot where he's like sitting there, and then like the, the kids in the playground, and, and, and I just kind of really, I remember I turned to you and I was like, you know, this is really criminal. Um, yeah. You know, and, and not to be over dramatic about it, but I mean, you know, I mean, I, I can understand why he was so depressed about making that movie. I think it was much um, more embarrassing than seeing him do a hound dog. Yeah. You know, much more tragic. Oh yeah, what yeah. What he got to do at that point? Yeah, I mean, and he was he was very depressed. I mean, I think that or very depressed about that movie. You know, from what people say, the the quality of that movie I think was particularly low. Um, but then he also had the experience where he he gained weight from all that like horseback riding and well, bread the crab eating. Dip. Yeah, no, not the crab dip. Out on the ranch with the bread and yeah, you know, riding um, the horse with, and eating the bread. Yeah, yeah, and so, which I love. I love that story too. Yeah, I yeah. love that image. Yeah. So he was being pressured to lose weight. He was taking diet pills. Um, he was taking all pills. That around the time that you know, by yeah. by by most sources or you know by some significant sources, that's when that really started to increase. Yeah. And so, um, famously, he you know the the official story is that he tripped over the TV cord when he was going to the bathroom at night and hit his head on the back of the tub. And what? I don't understand. Well, you know, there, there's a little flourish in Larry's book, which I'm not really sure what to make of, where he says that Elvis told him after this that he, he, he the way that he remembered it, somebody pushed him, or he felt like somebody was pushing him. It was dark, or, you know, he couldn't really see who it was. So that's Larry's version. That Elvis said that. That Elvis said that. And he does point out that, like, with the logistics of the way that things were set up, if he had tripped, he would have hit the front of his head. Well, that's what I don't you know? understand. It's hard. It's not impossible. But it's hard to trip over something. If, and, and fall backward. Yeah. yeah. I mean, how do you hit the back of your head if you trip over something that you're walking? I mean, I'm not saying it's impossible, but think about it. It's not very likely. Well, you know, there's a lot of speculation. He might have been trying to get out of Clambake or delay. Um, or he might have been trying to delay on the wedding because he was engaged by that point. So, you know, I mean, and, and this is just speculation. He could have passed out. Yeah, that's true. He's much more likely to get a a bump on the back of his head at passing out than he is tripping going forward. Yeah. And he may have been embarrassed and he made up a story about tripping because he didn't want anybody to know he passed up. You, know, you don't put that out. Yeah. And, you know, to be clear, I think all the, the theories that I was throwing out there are just speculations that people around him have said through the years. I, I don't know if any of them are true. Yeah, we um, have no way of knowing. Yeah, no way of knowing, yeah. And I, and I question Larry's like flourish there a little bit too it's very dramatic i mean larry definitely is of the opinion that th this was arranged by the colonel yeah, what was arranged by the colonel the fall that you know that this was somehow the colonel might have engineered so he so so larry implies in the book that it was that it, it's a colonel thing which is a pretty serious thing to say yeah and implies i want to you know to be clear he doesn't say i think the colonel made somebody push him but but it's inferred yeah um, and to me that seems terribly unlikely that's not the colonel's style for controlling Elvis. Yeah, I mean, it, it would and be a And who the hell would have done that? Yeah, Of yeah. the mafia. No, nobody in the mafia would have done that. It's hard to picture, isn't it? It is. I don't think that's... I think Larry's probably wrong about that. It, and it's an, it's an inference. He doesn't exactly say it, but, he, enough, but he certainly implies it. And then Larry also tells the story about how the colonel... Um, he always knew the colonel didn't like him. He was always messing with him and stuff like that, but... But he was always inviting him to come to his house, and he was real insistent about it. And, and Larry had no interest in doing that. He wanted him to bring his wife and kids. And um, then he finally, the colonel was acting in such a way about it that Larry got the impression that it would be considered an insult if he said no, so he kind of felt obligated to do it. Um, and so he went, he brought his he brought his children, they, they went to the colonel's home. The colonel, at some point, like, called Larry in, to the house, they were all outside in the pool, and he's on the phone with somebody, and he's saying these things like, like kind of these like mysterious things, like, yeah, mm -hmm, he's right here, yeah, now, now, mm -hmm, he's right in the room with me, mm -hmm. 
and then was like, Larry, my boy, let's go get ice cream. You know, I just wanted to keep him busy for like a certain period of time. And then when, according to Larry, when his family went home, their house had been trashed and specifically what had been targeted were his spiritual books, these like astrology charts he had had drawn up for Elvis, um, everything spiritual, spirituality related, as well as like his clothes. But the worst part was he claimed that there was... Someone had urinated and defecated, like like human urine and defecation, in, in his house. That's a bit beyond the pale, right? Yes. I don't know. It's mysterious. The whole thing is very mysterious. And then that kind of takes us to, uniformly, everybody tells the story the same way. The same dialogue, ah. the same words said by the colonel, the same events, same body language from Elvis. Yeah, that's very rare. And that's very, very rare. You know, So that makes me think, okay, this did happen exactly like this because <laughs> everybody's uniform in it. Elvis allegedly had a concussion from the fall, and the colonel was very concerned about this. So afterwards, he calls everybody to a meeting, and he, like, he lays down the law. And basically, he kind of blames the fall on the idea that like things have gotten out of hand. People are getting sloppy time to tighten the reins they're gonna have to make some changes in the outfit marty lacker's out as the foreman joe esposito is back in everybody's got to take a pay cut the colonel is now going to start taking more because he's doing so much to try to get things under control so he deserves more more income for this elvis you're getting married um and <laughs> you're well they, i think more like you need to set a date and and Nobody is to be filling his head with these spiritual ideas or talking to him about ideas that are confusing him and basically saying, like, obviously talking about Larry, right? Yeah. And so Larry's kind of sitting there and, and, and Elvis, you know, according to everybody, just really sat there and looked very dejected. But did say, like, everything he's about to say is, is me too. But, you know, by most accounts, I mean, the, the colonel clearly took advantage of that situation. Yeah. Um, and, you know... Whether he's he engineered it or not, he took advantage of it use it to gain control of a lot of different things, you know, because he, he thought things were getting sloppy, you know, but... Well, they were getting out of his control, and that was unacceptable. <laughs> yes, and it was a good opportunity to get rid of Larry, too, and somehow Elvis reading these books was part of why he fell in, in the colonel's logic. Yeah. So he didn't fire Larry, because I think this was the colonel's M.O., too. He, he didn't say no to things so much as he just made it impossible for them to happen, you know? Mm -hmm. So it was, more, it was more like he just set a rule that, like, Larry wasn't allowed to be alone with Elvis. He wasn't allowed to talk to him about spirituality. He wasn't allowed to bring him any more books. In Larry's second book, he doesn't really go into, like, his interactions with Elvis after this. But in the first book, he does. And so he says that, like, right after this, he came to the set of Elvis's movie, and it was the first time Elvis didn't have a book with him. And Elvis kind of looked at him flatly and said, those books were, were messing up my brain. I'm, I'm not going to read them anymore. But it was kind of cold and flat to Larry, you know, kind of shut yeah. down, kind of withdrawn from him. When he was cutting Elvis's hair, where it used to take hours because they'd get in these really animated conversations. It took like 15 minutes and there was always somebody present. You know, he chose to leave at that point. So according to him, for the next five years, he and Elvis were completely estranged from each other until 1972. And Larry, at that point, managed a New Age bookstore. He was working on a, a New Age magazine. He claims that during that time, he would occasionally see one of Elvis's cars following him. And he interpreted this as, like, Elvis was kind of keeping tabs, you know, that kind of thing. But he didn't hear from him. Elvis comes back into his life because when Larry worked at the New Age bookstore, this was also an opportunity for him to meet celebs. Because a lot of people, there were celebrities who were interested in this. And they came right. to the bookstore. And they were interested in what he had to say and stuff. So he, he formed these bonds. So he befriended the singer Johnny Rivers, who came to the bookstore and had an interest in the New Age. He became Johnny Rivers' road manager. And um, and during that time, at one point, um, according to Larry, Johnny Rivers kind of said to him, oh, you know, Elvis is going through a really tough time. He and Priscilla just divorced, and he needs you. Now, that's interesting because he doesn't really qualify that to say how Johnny Rivers knew this mm -hmm. or whether this was just something he intuited or felt like it would be helpful for Larry to be there or if, it, like Elvis had somehow sent word about this or communicated it. He does mention that Johnny and Elvis were friends, but, but not really a lot of details about how close they may have been or how much contact they had. But anyway, this led to Johnny and Larry going to Vegas to see Elvis perform. Larry talked to him after the show, got a very warm welcome from Elvis. Elvis took him up to his suite and he showed him where he had all his spiritual books. He did share that at Priscilla's behest, after after Larry left, they had burned the book. And, you know, Priscilla wouldn't, we didn't really talk about her too much in this, but when we kind of talk about the reaction of people in Elvis's life to Larry, 
Priscilla was was another person who, by her own admission, really resented Larry. You know, she's pretty frank about that in her book. And she makes a point of saying that Larry was very nice. It really wasn't that he ever did anything. But she resented his closeness with Elvis, um, how much time Elvis spent with him. And Elvis also told him, I've been keeping tabs on you. I know about the bookstore. I know about the magazine. It's almost like you never really left because I thought a lot about our conversations and I rebought all the books I burned. You know, this is very, a very active part of my life. I take the books everywhere I go. Then the timeline gets fuzzy, you know, and I think this is one of the complaints that some of the other people in Elvis's circle have about Larry is that perhaps maybe he makes it seem like he was around and actively engaged in Elvis's life for longer than he really was. Yeah. I, I think by Larry's own tellings, the years between 1972 and 1976 are kind of fuzzy, so it's hard to get a handle on what their relationship might have been like at that time. But it is an established fact that in 1976, he did come back full time. Right. Because um, I've seen pictures of him off stage yeah. in that time period. You know, and in Hawaii. Maybe yeah, right. Yeah. Um, Pictures yeah, I mean, that, that's established. Nobody disputes that he was there that last year. Yeah. And in his book, he, in the, the book he wrote in the late 80s, he shared what he claims was his secret diary that he kept during that time. So this is a very detailed description of Elvis's last year. It's a very sad part of the book. I, I found it to be really sad to read. So Larry kept this secret diary, or what Larry publishes in the book is what he says was a secret diary he kept during that last year with Elvis. Of course, it's impossible to know how how much of this may have been reconstructed from memory and how much of it was written in real time. But I found it to be a very sad part of the book. It was, yeah. it was sad to read about that year. It's hard to get a handle on what Elvis's relationship with spirituality was really like during that time. Yeah, well, he was probably kind of confused during that time, you know. I mean, he was, obviously, he was having a hard time then. You know, he wasn't at his best. One of the bright spots was uh, two or three months before he died, he had that one performance of uh, Unchained Melody that's so famous uh, where he reached down deep and uh, and hit those notes and it's hard not so to stirring. yeah so it's stirring. hard not to feel the joy that he you know when he grins and looks at around as if to say you know hey look I did it one more time you know and um it, it's really hard to not get chills when you watch that it's very stirring yeah um, it's, it's, a, it's a pretty powerful piece of footage the vocals are, are so beautiful too. It's yeah, you nailed it. Yeah, it's a very, very <laughs> powerhouse performance. Yeah. Um, I completely understand why Baz Luhrmann chose to have that be the ending scene for the movie. It's, it's just so powerful. Yeah, it's very strong when it hits, you know. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So, in closing, Larry Geller, yay or nay? You know, I mean, it's complicated, but, um, but I'm going to go with yay. Okay. What about you? I'm going to go with yay. Um, All right. I think it's worth noting that Larry, like everybody else, he has gotten a lot of mileage out of his association with Elvis. He's written a total of three books, which is a lot. That's a lot. Yeah. Um, you know, and of course he's done the documentary circuit. And, and he's got some workbooks and some he's released coloring books. DVD. Um, you know, I mean, but, you know, that's true of everybody. And, um, and, you know, I'll also say, I think Larry is, as I mentioned earlier, a very gifted storyteller. I think that maybe he does sometimes put some flourishes on things, and there have been some inconsistencies, which other people have pointed out. But again, I mean, you know, that's that's true of a lot of people. Yeah, because everybody would scatter, rip the pool table. <laughs> that's right, yeah. <laughs> it probably was scatter. It really probably good. was scatter, you yeah. know. I mean, they can't all be right. <laughs> yeah. Um, when we, when we went to Graceland, the person that was our guide told this story about how at one point Graceland had contacted all the living members of the Memphis Mafia. And it was like some time ago, so I think they were pretty much able to get a hold of everybody just to see if they could get any insight on who had actually put the hole in the pool table. And according to her, everybody claimed credit for it. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm Spartacus! I'm Spartacus! <laughs> so... Which is easy enough to believe. Yeah. Um, so. That's one but, of the, the mysteries that will never be solved. Well, Larry, if you're watching this, um, I'd like to borrow some money. <laughs> we love you, Larry. Um, <laughs> if you enjoyed this video, please like, share, and subscribe. Thank yeah, you so cool. much for watching. Um, and please share your comments, too. And we'll see you next time. Yeah. And during this time is when Elvis had a tremendous spiritual awakening in the desert. He saw a vision in the clouds.
the face of Christ, and that really changed his life. I mean.